Hello, and welcome to the Osterholm Update, COVID-19, a weekly podcast on the COVID-19 pandemic with Dr. Michael Osterholm. Dr. Osterholm is an internationally recognized medical detective and director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy, or CIDRAP, at the University of Minnesota. In this podcast, Dr. Osterholm will draw on more than 45 years of experience investigating infectious disease outbreaks to provide straight talk on the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm Chris Dahl, reporter for CIDRAP News, and I'm your host for these conversations. Mike, since we last spoke, the number of COVID-19 cases and deaths in the U.S. has continued to grow exponentially, with more than 400,000 confirmed cases and 13,000 deaths. What's your assessment of where we are in this pandemic? Well, thank you, Chris. I think it's a very sobering note to think that these numbers of cases, which clearly reflect loved ones, uh, friends, family, uh, are in, while enormous in size, they are just the beginning of what we're about to experience. When we take a step back and think about a pandemic of a respiratory pathogen like this, uh, the one that obviously comes to mind first and foremost is influenza. And so far that this particular coronavirus has acted from a transmission standpoint virtually identical to what we'd expect to see with an influenza virus and is why we've been able to track it and predict it as well as we have. I think the, most of the audience may be aware of the fact that we actually on January 20th uh, wrote a piece that declared that this would in fact be a global pandemic and on February 3rd actually even laid out the, the fact that based on the amount of time it would take once introduced into a given area of the world for the number of generations of transmission where cases would be doubling with each generation or time from infection until being uh, infectious would take about a month to a month and a half. We actually uh, suggested that by the last week of February, first week of March, we would start seeing cases around the world with sustained transmission. Some would be hot spots, some would be less intense. And this virus has done just that. So I'm more confident today than ever that it will be like an influenza pandemic occurring in a population that is virtually completely susceptible to this virus. I say that because uh, I worry that right now we're approaching what's happening in the United States, or for that matter, around the world, as if all we have to do is just get over this one hump. We have to flatten this one curve one time. If you're in New York City, Uh, or Detroit, or New Orleans, or any other area like that, that is first and foremost. It is uh, a crisis that you could never have imagined before. We're seeing the same thing through uh, the European Union, uh, particularly in Italy and and Spain, uh, other countries starting to come on board. And what we must not forget in the first instance, if we go back and look at the 1918 influenza pandemic, and I'm making the assumption that this will act much like that. While there was a early spring wave that caused significant illness and deaths, it was superseded by a fall wave that occurred that was much larger. And that was the one that was the heavy impact uh, in terms of, of both cases and deaths in 1918. But what also we forget to remember is that 1919 and 1920 continued that pandemic. That uh, You saw waves that occurred in both years throughout the world, including the United States, and some places had as many as three different waves of activity that occurred. And so I I raise this because uh, I don't want to minimize for a moment what's happening uh, in the United States or around the world with these hotspots and the transmission. But I I fear that we are in that mindset, like if if this were a hurricane, where Uh, All we have to do is wait till the uh, eye passes the shore and we can get into recovery. That's not going to be the case here. What I worry about today is that we don't have that long view, that this is in fact a marathon, not a sprint. And while those who have been in the heat of these very intense transmission uh, fires, like in New York, New Jersey, uh, in Chicago, New Orleans, et cetera, um, they can't even imagine, I'm sure, that they've got 18 or more months of this and that they have potentially even bigger waves yet to come. But that's the reality. Now, the only thing that's going to save us from this is going to be a vaccine. Uh, That will be the one 
game changer that will fundamentally change what's happening. Uh, if we can get that, that would be great. But I think we can't at all count on uh, a vaccine arriving anywhere before 18 to 20 months. If we get treatments, that'll help to the extent that it'll reduce the serious illnesses and deaths, but it won't really have any impact necessarily on the number of cases and even those seeking health care. Uh, so the bottom line is it is progressing here in the United States as we suspected. Uh, we're going to continue to see transmission in areas around the country. Uh, I, I think right now one of the other uh, areas of growing concern has been that with long-term care facilities in many states where they have served almost like kind of what I would call viral grenades, where once you get uh, COVID-19 in a long-term care facility, it transmits relatively quickly to many other residents. By the time that's recognized, there have been many community-based uh, individuals who have come to the long-term care facility to see mom or dad or grandpa and grandma. They bring that back out into the community, whether you're 1,000 in population or you're 2 million in population. Um, and then that infection starts transmitting in the community. And also many of these long-term care facility patients are ending up in hospitals with their illness. That then amplifies the situation there. So I think we're on a long road with this virus. We're going to have uh, more of these events uh, where we're going to have hot spots show up. We're going to have those environments like uh, long-term care and healthcare where there'll be a special uh, concern that we'll have. Uh, but but the message is, this is we're in this for the long haul. This week, we're starting to see some encouraging signs from some of the epicenters of the COVID-19 pandemic. Cases and deaths are down in Italy. Hospitalizations have slowed in New York. How should the public interpret this news? And are, are you concerned about people letting down their guard at the first sign of good news? Well, first of all, uh, let's take a step back again and look at what do data tell us about what's happening. Um, we have to remember that you have infections occurring when people in the community, for a large part, share air with others who are infected. That causes the case to actually get infected uh, and then five or seven days later become a case. Then what we see is this progression of illness uh, for those who are going to get uh, clinically ill that will last then for another five to seven days uh, with progression then from there, often one to two to up to three weeks later of serious illness, ultimately resulting in hospitalization and then uh, uh, being put into intensive care and then dying. And so you really have almost three to four weeks from the time that transmission occurs until you have the in-stage deaths. So you have to understand when you count deaths, you're largely counting a, a transmission that occurred almost a month before. It doesn't give you current activity. Uh, if you're looking at hospitalizations, that gives you probably a, a period of, of seven to 14 days after transmission that you're seeing that kind of situation. So uh, what we've seen in Italy has been a situation where there's been a reduction in the number of people being admitted to hospitals and number of deaths that have occurred, suggesting that what was happening over the last three weeks was really truly a, a reduced transmission at the community level. And that's an important point because uh, uh, it's often uh, the kind of interpretation where one or two days worth of numbers and suddenly one will declare um, an increasing crisis or victory. We actually saw that this week in New York where we had two days of down numbers. And then suddenly, uh, the third day, New York actually spiked and had its highest number of deaths uh, in terms of uh, what happened there. And it didn't really change overall what was happening in New York. So what I recommend, one, is first understand this timeline from transmission to becoming a case, to becoming severely ill, to dying, and then also uh, be very careful about interpreting numbers in terms of one or two days. I personally, um, when I look at data like this, I won't make a, uh, a sense of a determination unless I see at least 10 days of either increasing or decrease in numbers to say, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we've over the top of the peak here, we're flattening the curve, as has been so well known now, or we're still in a growth phase. And so I think anything short of 10 days 
uh, of consistent trend data and uh, were very, very uh, susceptible to the, the, what I guess I would call the uh, a kind of erratic nature of how cases increase, decrease by time. Mike, as you know, a number of models have been published estimating or projecting uh, COVID-19 cases and deaths. Uh, Imperial College of London, University of Washington uh, are, are two of the most well-known models right now. Uh, wh- what do you make of these models and, 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 and what should the public think of them? One of the real challenges in dealing with a situation like this is that there is an abundance of models being created by people throughout the world. And some may say, well, that actually adds to the knowledge that we have about this situation. Uh, But I always have ascribed to the fact that all models are wrong and that some provide helpful information. As someone who's had more than 60 hours of graduate statistic credit, uh, I would be the first to say that I, too, do not understand many of the black box kind of uh, maturations that go on with creating models. But I do understand the conditions upon which the models are based on have everything to say about what a model is telling us. For example, the University of Washington model, which was done by a very competent and capable group of researchers, is predicated on the fact that we're talking about what's going to happen the next four months, roughly, under the kind of lockdown conditions that virtually happened only in Wuhan. And I have not seen reproduced anywhere else in the world. Um, With that kind of a model, you're going to come up with one set of numbers that I think are terribly unrealistic, uh, only because of the fact we can't accomplish that kind of a lockdown here. And again, we have to be very careful because it's for an extended period of time of four months. The other models that have been created have looked at different conditions. For example, both the Imperial College model and the Harvard model have really looked at this through the duration of 18 months with the idea that uh, there would be differing impacts of distancing that would occur that would slow down transmission. In those cases, those models come up with estimates of death for the United States, for example, of between one and two million people. What I'm finding is is that these models have almost become an ongoing debate in the partisan political world. One saying that the high numbers are really only but a ploy to uh, bring some kind of negative light to this administration and that they're really trying to scare people that somehow uh, we're not telling the truth and that just it's another example of going after the president. Others have said in the very low numbers, oh, well, this is just an underestimate trying to bury the problem and that, in fact, it's much worse than this and this kind of planning numbers are, in fact, dangerous because they uh, in a sense, give us the security of underpreparing for what's coming down the pike. Well, I don't think that there should be any partisan politics or, for that matter, black box maturations that causes confusion or concern. I, uh, I liken it to where I come from in Iowa, where a lot of common sense gets spoken on the main street of small town Iowa. And I sit there and think, OK, can I explain this to somebody and walk on? very smart, intelligent people, but common sense people. And so I say, throw out the models, get rid of them. Uh, You know, they're, they're, they're going to be accused of being whatever. And I say, just, let's just do the following analysis. And if you don't like the numbers I'm going to put out here, then you create your own, but tell me why and how you got them. So let's take, for example, there's 320 million Americans. If we assume over the next 16 to 18 months that up to 50% will become infected and based on previous pandemics of influenza, based on what we're seeing now, that is not at all an unrealistic view. In fact, some would argue that I've been conservative in saying 50%. That's 160 million people. Then if you look at what we know about the clinical spectrum, including adding in some asymptomatic infections, whether you're looking at Asia, Europe, or the United States, assume that 80% of these individuals have mild maybe asymptomatic, up to moderate illness, but not seeking medical care. 20%, the remaining, of those, about 10% will seek medical care and may have short-term hospitalizations. 10 who will be more severely ill will require hospitalization, and of those, about 5% or half of the 10% will require intensive care medicine. We're going to need to be in an intensive care unit. 
Then you look at that and about 1% will die. 1% case fatality rate. Well, 1% of 160 million is 1.6 million people. That is the course of an 18 month event. And uh, again, if you don't like the numbers that I just laid out, you know, lay out your own numbers. But I think those are relatively conservative. They are surely based on the best science we have. They're based on past experience. That gives you a sense that over the next year to 18 months before a vaccine might arrive, that that's what you could expect to have happen. And that is even considering the potential for social distancing or physical distancing, as I like to call it, um, because we just can't stop this virus. So, so I think the really important point to know here is, is that if you consider the number of deaths or I, and, and even look at the 5% that might very well uh, be in intensive care, uh, which is well over 9 million people, um, these are going to overwhelm our system. And what we've seen so far is just a warm up to what these will bring. And that's what we have to prepare for. You know, I hear when people say to me, oh, Mike, you can't say these things. This will just scare people. This will panic. Again, I come back to the fact that I am absolutely convinced we don't see panic in the public when you present them with the truth. Have you seen anybody overturning cars or, you know, riding in the streets? Have you seen uh, even in situations where somebody grabs the last roll of toilet paper ahead of you at a, one of the department stores, somebody pulling a knife or a gun? We haven't seen that. But people are really scared. People are really concerned. And that's where if you just give them the straight talk, they will, in fact, respond with, OK, so what are we going to do about it? And I think that's the right thing to do. So I look at this by saying, you know, I put those numbers out there. Uh, with all of the clarity of how they were arrived at, no black boxes. And I say, you know, my job is not to scare you out of your wits, to scare you into your wits. This is going to be a tough 12 to 18 months. We got to get on with telling people that because that means then we can get on with planning for it. We can get on, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to keep our society moving forward in a way that is not about dollars and cents. And I just categorically reject this idea when you talk about the economy, you're talking about how much is the head worth. That's just not true. But we're talking about how do you maintain essential services? How do you bring back uh, the kind of livelihoods that so many people have now lost? How do you do that at the same time protecting as many lives as you can and getting us through to the time when a vaccine might be available? So I think in the model world right now, They'll keep getting thrown out. They'll keep getting used. The news media will fixate on them. Uh, and in my mind, I'm just telling you right now, this is what you can expect. And uh, if I'm wrong, I, which I hope I am, we'll figure out which number was wrong uh, or numbers. And we'll go from there. In the meantime, you've got to plan, one, for long term, and two, you got to plan. This is going to be a very significant and impactful event in our communities. Let's talk about who's being affected uh, by by COVID-19. Uh, early data from the U.S. are indicating that, that more men are getting infected than women uh, and that COVID-19 appears more deadly for men than women. Uh, we're also seeing an emerging racial gap in cities like Chicago, where black residents are dying at a rate nearly six times that of white Chicagoans. Is it too early to be making conclusions about some of this data? Well, first of all, the data are what they are in terms of deaths. And um, I think it's a very sad commentary. Again, I just always keep remembering the fact that these deaths are real people. Uh, last night, I mean, I had one of those moments. Uh, and one might think that it's, you know, a, a kind of a crazy thing for somebody in this business to say. But as a, a kid and in my early adult years, I grew up in John Prine music. Um, you know, it was meant a lot to me and some tough times in my life. John Prine's songs and lyrics got me through. To hear that he died last night of COVID-19, you know, was one of those moments where it brought tears to my eyes, you know? This is the kind of thing that's going to happen more and more. So when we talk about deaths, um, they are personal. But at the same time, as epidemiologists, we talk about them in the collective we because of the community and what we do. Let me just say that what's happening with the deaths in the United States, as we have seen around the world, doesn't surprise me a bit. We've been talking about for some time this concept of comorbidities, these underlying risk factors that predispose you to having more serious disease as well as fatal outcomes. Uh, we saw it in China. Uh, we saw the fact that uh, we had a, a greatly increased uh, 
incidence of severe disease and deaths in older men. Uh, in China, almost 70% of men over age 65 smoke. That is an underlying risk factor for this. Americans listening to this or anyone in the world, if you're a smoker, please try to stop. I know it's it's tough, but this is one of those times you don't want to be a smoker. Um, the difference there in terms of what we might be seeing today is the incidence of obesity is very, very rare in older Chinese citizens, uh, something that's not the case around the world. That wasn't a major risk factor. Essential hypertension, having high blood pressure was a risk factor for having bad outcome. Um, what we couldn't explain in the Chinese data, which is the one thing that does carry over for the rest of uh, all the other countries, is the male-female ratio. There's something clearly about men when you can account for all other risk factors that make for a difference in what's happening. We don't know that. When you get out of uh, the Asian data sets and get into ours, for example, in the United States, and you mentioned this in, in the communities of color and among our, our black uh, residents, this very major increase in number of deaths, I am quite certain when you actually adjust on uh, the frequency of diabetes, underlying heart disease, and obesity, that that will equalize out a lot of the numbers we're seeing, meaning in terms of the increased occurrence. Those are all well-known risk factors from influenza, and we believe now are holding true for the coronaviruses here, the, the COVID-19, as being a major risk factor. So it's not something that's unique about race. It's about underlying health conditions, which, by the way, do speak to a major need in this country as well around the world to address these issues. Not not in the presence just of a COVID pandemic, but in general uh, to deal with them. I think these are all going to show to be uh, explainable. Uh, we've seen that in Italy. Uh, we're seeing that in other countries. I uh, heard often, you know, about the very low case fatality rate in Korea early on in the outbreak. You know, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 per, uh, percent, much lower than it was seen in other countries. And sure enough, the original cases in Korea that caused the numbers to be escalated very quickly were, in fact, those associated with one religious sect. And the median age of that group was about 42 years. Um, in that population, deaths were relatively rare compared to other populations just by the nature of age and, again, frequency underlying uh, comorbidities or health challenges. When the outbreak began to spread in more of the country, and we saw it in older individuals, uh, the case fatality rate went up. And now I believe in Korea, it's almost 1.4 uh, uh, percent, almost double what it was. And it was just a function of who got infected. We look at Germany right now, the lower case fatality rate clearly was impacted by its initial introduction into people who were skiing in Italy and brought it back to Germany and the spread in that population versus that in older populations. Um, also, I think their healthcare system, which has an, uh, one of the most uh, abundant supplies of intensive care medicine beds in the world, also has helped out a lot in their aggressive program there. But each country really is going to be a microcosm of all of its comorbidities relative to COVID-19. And so expect to see other countries have differences in terms of what the case fatality rate might be. There is one thing that is a fundamental game changer that we have to anticipate that is universal to the world also. And that is, it's not about the risk factors for individuals uh, by their racial, ethnic, or uh, gender makeup. It's do they have access to intensive care medicine? And depending on how you split the numbers somewhere between half to 20% uh, of people will uh, survive being on mechanical ventilation. Um, clearly, we know that a lot of people still die on that. But the availability of a ventilator may be the very big difference between living and dying. And those choices right now are so painful for intensivists to have to make. But when you go over the edge, when you hit the what I call the ventilator cliff, and you don't have any ventilators left, then the case mortality rates for those individuals are going to go up substantially because there you're virtually uh, assuming that most of them are going to die. And that is a real challenge. That's why this is not just a function of trying to provide the best medical care from the healthcare provider standpoint, which they want to do. It's also about 
what will happen to these patients if they don't have mechanical ventilation. This is not a academic debate. This is a crisis. And so if we get into these bigger waves anywhere in the world, and this kind of intensive care medical support is not available, expect to see case mortality rates go up substantially. Turning back to Asia, Wuhan, the Chinese city where the COVID-19 pandemic began, has begun easing its lockdown measures, while Japan has now declared a state of emergency due to rising cases and deaths. And Singapore is also seeing a rise in cases. What are you going to be watching for in Asia over the coming weeks and months? Well, we're actually watching something that is already in process. Um, And that is what I would call the return of uh, the COVID-19 challenge. Uh, When the initial uh, response occurred in China, it resulted in, without a doubt, the most uh, draconian, for another reason, to say uh, population movement restrictions we've ever seen in any population in modern times related to a public health event. And uh, they literally shut down, as the world knows, much of Wuhan and large parts of the Hubei province. That limited distancing was critical in so-called flattening the curve. Uh, But as we've learned, uh, this virus, like any respectable respiratory transmission virus, particularly in the flu or coronavirus family, um, is not ever put out by doing that kind of distancing. It's only merely reduced. And they did an amazing job in China of doing that. And you can argue, you know, what methods they used, how they did it. But what's happening today, and there was an outstanding article in today's Wall Street Journal that actually describes what's going on in Wuhan right now. And as they're releasing people back into the worst force, there's clearly evidence of influenza still there in that community. Some four months after these lockdowns and extreme measures were taken. And there's also some real challenges understanding the data. Um, There's been a number of assertions made by individuals, some who I know well and trust uh, very, very much in terms of their expertise and contacts in China, that are convinced that the Chinese government is not now reporting all their cases. Uh, For example, they will report out 80 to 90 asymptomatic infections in a given day, meaning that they were tested, found positive, and then only one or two cases, actually clinically ill. That makes no sense whatsoever. None. None of the data we have supports you would have that kind of a asymptomatic to symptomatic ratio. That's telling us that there's probably more transmission going on. Uh, I'd like to know why they, in opening up Hubei, went ahead and closed down the movie theaters uh, a week and a half ago in China. Um, and so I think that we have real challenges yet understanding what's going on there. But I have alleged, as you know, for some time that it would just be a matter of time before any kind of relaxation of these very stringent measures would result in a return of the virus. And I think that's what's happening. It clearly is happening in those other Asian countries that we have put so much stock in as to they know how to do it, including Singapore, Japan, and Korea, uh, Hong Kong. Look at all of them right now with big increases in case numbers. Singapore last week actually Uh, declaring a national state of emergency. Uh, Japan this past weekend declaring uh, that seven prefectures were now in states of emergency. Um, This is really uh, evident of what we've been saying all along. Trying to stop the transmission of this virus is like trying to stop the wind. So clearly you can do a number of things to reduce transmission, but you're not going to get rid of it. And so people who use these Asian countries as models have to ask themselves, uh, if we want to do this, which you know, it makes good sense from a public health standpoint in terms of reducing case numbers, you're going to have to really have uh, quite remarkable and comprehensive control measures in place uh, that I don't think are actually doable in most of the world. And so that's where, again, I come back to what do we need uh, most of all right now? We need a national plan. How are we going to thread the rope through that needle? How are we going to decide we can't go in total lockdown, but we can't also just say, okay, go back to normal. How do we bring back society in a way that is still challenging that virus in our virus versus human battle, but at the same time also recognizing the reality that we have to get back to a societal norm, uh, if there is such a thing, that, that allows essential services and other parts of the economy to expand? 
you know that around all of this is going to be the debate, the question, uh, the uh, academic uh, uh, issue of how do we bring back the younger population right now into this uh, environment where they have by far the best chance of having uh, minimal clinical illness, of having the least likelihood of being hospitalized and and dying. And how much are we talking about? You know, it's it's uh, this is where numerators become as important as numerators and denominators. One person dying who is 18 uh, makes people feel, oh my. Uh, but in the big picture of things, if that was one person out of 2 million in that age group versus 12% of those who are dying who are age 65 who have a major underlying health factor, that's a big difference. We have to be able to have that discussion right now in such a way that people don't take the position that, one, we're only talking about money over lives. We're not. Number two is that uh, somehow anything we do is justified in the name of trying to prevent cases when we don't have an idea whether it works or what the collateral damage is. So we need wise, thoughtful, and, and, and I would have to say visionary people right now to help us work through this, and then we need the leadership to carry it out. The National Academy of Sciences has released uh, two new reports, uh, one on the survival of SARS-CoV-2 virus in relation to temperature and humidity and, and the potential for seasonal reduction of COVID-19 cases, and another on the use of cloth masks by the public. Uh, what are your thoughts on these reports, Mike? Well, first of all, I think that uh, they were uh, major efforts done by the Academy in limited time, uh, and I congratulate them. I, I have to be a little bit uh, cautious and clearly um, uh, disclose here that I was involved with one of those. I was actually part of the expert advisor group brought in to look at cloth masks. But let me just take both of them because I think they really exemplify the challenges we have today in trying to deal with this pandemic and getting out correct information. Uh, let's just take seasonality. Uh, why is that important? Because everybody's assuming right now that there will be a a summer hiatus of cases, and that that's what's normal. And therefore, uh, that's what we expect to see with seasonal flu. Let me just take a step back and say, well, that's not true. If one looks at uh, the two uh, uh, coronavirus infections most closely related to this virus, SARS and MERS, SARS uh, occurred in the Guangdong province in the fall and early winter of 2002, jumping over into the Guangdong province to China, uh, Hong Kong in February of 2003. At that point, it then spread around the world. What we found with that particular uh, virus was that, in fact, you weren't really that infectious till day four or five or even later in your illness. And it took us several months to understand that. But once we did, we were able to isolate these people in hospitals where they didn't transmit to anyone else after they became infectious. And uh, we also were able to then identify contacts of these individuals and get them to be uh, in isolation so that if they did get sick, they could be, too, put into um, isolation in a way that they wouldn't transmit to others. On top of that, we were able to identify the animal that was responsible for transmitting this virus in the markets of the Guangdong province to humans, and that was eliminated so there were no additional pings. That whole process ended in June of 2003, not at all indicative of seasonality, but rather it just took that long to complete it. Had, I think, the cases first emerged in October of 2002, we would have basically brought it under control by March of 2003. The second one is MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, which occurs largely on the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, this is one that I've also been in, very involved with. And I can tell you, having been in Abu Dhabi when it was 110 degrees and transmission was going on just fine, thank you, uh, there a transmission from camels occurs year-round to humans. Uh, we see outbreaks in healthcare facilities year-round when they get humans infected and brought into hospitals. No evidence there to support that there again is uh, some kind of seasonality. Now, the other coronaviruses that cause the common colds and one that does cause a type of pneumonia have been shown to be seasonal in nature, but they're also very, very different in terms of the epidemiology and transmission. The other area that people always assume with seasonality is, well, if influenza is seasonal, why shouldn't this be? You've been putting a lot of stock into this influenza transmission model. 
but I don't think people realize that influenza is a much more complicated transmission disease than, than one might think. While living in the northern and southern hemispheres, we surely do uh, uh, get a sense of seasonality with our winters, but don't forget that influenza virus transmits year-round in the tropics. We've never really been able to understand and explain that. So hot, warmer, humid weather. In addition, there have been 10 influenza pandemics in the past 250 plus years. Uh, these pandemics, again, like 1918, emerged at different times and then ran their course largely for about two years. Um, if you look at the 10 influenza pandemics that I just mentioned, uh, actually two started in the Northern Hemisphere winter, three in the spring, two in the summer, and three in the fall. All had a peak second wave approximately six months after the emergence of the virus in the human population, regardless of when the initial introduction occurred. So, for example, in 2009 with H1N1, when we saw that emerge in late March, early April of that year, um, and sure enough, about six months later, from mid-September to mid-October uh, mid in the United States was the second peak wave. Those were very warm months at the time. So when something is a new infectious agent like influenza uh, pandemic strain, or for that matter, I believe it's coronavirus, we can't expect that it's going to be seasonal. And I only point this out because this may seem like to many to be an academic debate. It's not, because it also points out we have to be ready to go from now until forever, in the sense 16, 18 months, if hopefully have a vaccine at 18 months. Um, because we don't might, may not get a, a, a summertime lull. And I worry about that with regard to planning, because I think in that regard, uh, people now are saying, well, if we can just get over this peak right now in New York or in, in, in Chicago or in Paris or Madrid, you know, we're going to be fine for the remainder of, uh, of the year until we get into the fall. I don't think you can count on that at all. The second area that the Academy, as, I, as you noted and I mentioned, was involved with was, in fact, this issue around cloth masks. And, you know, let me say at the outset, uh, you know, having been in public health for 45 years, um, and I think probably most who know me would say I've been fairly proactive during that time, and I'm willing to throw the kitchen sink at something that is a serious public health challenge if doing that doesn't cause more damage than it does good. And so therefore, I'm open to everything. And with this pandemic, more than anything in my lifetime, have I been open to, you know, what can we do? But I think we also have to continue to remain based on a scientific uh, uh, foundation as to what we do or don't do. And I think this is one of those issues. Now, this is an emotional issue. There are people who have made their decisions about this, and my mail surely reflects that, as does others. Uh, that if you're for cloth masks, you're for preventing transmission to people. If you're not, you're not. And that's just simply not the case. Um, let me just take a step back from respiratory protection. And we actually have a series of documents uh, on our website that address respiratory protection that have been written by several of the world's experts in this area. Um, and first of all, let's just remember there's N95 respirators, the tight face-fitting uh, mask that actually has a unique matrix material uh, that is actually capable of allowing air to pass through it, but stopping viruses. And it has a very tight face fit so that nothing leaks in around that particular matrix. So the air has got to come through that. It traps the virus. The second one is the surgical mask, which by its very name should tell you something about its history. It started out originally as a way for uh, protecting patients particularly people who are being operated on, from surgeons, from basically their body fluids coming out and getting into an incision or a wound. Um, it wasn't ever about, in a sense, protecting the actual healthcare worker. Now, we've learned over time that these masks will trap large droplets, big particles that come out, and that they can embed into a mask like that uh, but however, aerosols, those much more tiny droplet type materials that are smaller, will very easily escape out the sides of these masks, which are not airtight, because that's where most of the air is coming in and out. You're not breathing through much of the actual mask itself. You're breathing through these sides. And then you have the cloth, which has varying degrees of thickness. Uh, and in many cases, you may be breathing directly through the fabric. Uh, which brings the virus right through, plus you have the face fit issues itself. 
Now, so when you look at those three, we currently recommend both N95s for healthcare workers as well as surgical masks only. Surgical masks are not the perfect protection that healthcare workers should have. But when you have a absence of such in 95s, you go with surgical masks as the next best approach. Surgical masks have also been found to be useful, as I pointed out with the surgeon issue, but also if you have a patient who is coughing, who has clinical signs and symptoms, putting that on their face will in fact help keep the particles from escaping into the environment, even though it doesn't do much at all to stop any of the aerosols. In terms of what we're talking about today with the use of these is really twofold. One is basically protecting the individual. I just laid out um, that we have data that N95 surely protect better than uh, uh, surg or surgical masks, uh, which then protect better than cloth masks as such. Um, but if you look at source control, now using it is to say, well, you know, we're going to really concentrate on putting them on so that if somebody is infectious, they don't transmit to someone else. I've already made the case that N95 should do that because if the virus doesn't go out, it doesn't come in, um, vice versa. I've also said this about the issue of surgical masks, that they can, in fact, have some impact uh, in terms of transmission. But if you look at the cloth mass, actually, um, there the aerosols will come right out. And remember, we're talking now about putting these on asymptomatic individuals or people who are in the pre-symptomatic stage. We have never suggested for a moment that someone who's clinically ill should be in the public space. They shouldn't be. And so therefore, this really boiled down to, if I put them on people who are not symptomatic, will I stop them from transmitting? Well, if aerosols are an important part of this transmission, I think if there's been any revelation in the last several weeks has been the important roles that aerosol, these tiny little droplets that float in the air when we talk. And we know when you talk, you produce aerosols. People want to understand what an aerosol is. Next time when you think about looking at that sunlight coming through your window and you see all that material floating in that sunlight, that's an aerosol. It's sitting there floating, stays for some time. Or if you want a better example, just think about going to the next, uh, department store and you're four aisles away from the perfume department and you can still smell the perfume. That's an aerosol. So the question is, do these cloth masks really help reduce transmission if aerosols play an important role? And I think right now, as the uh, National Academy of Science report said, we don't have any data to support that, that that's the case. So people will say, well, let's go ahead anyway and use them. And, you know, if a citizen wants to put them on, go for it. Uh, just don't do it when you're symptomatic and being in public. But what I worry about very, very much is the fact that people assume that if cloth masks are good, surgical masks are even better. And if I can just get my hands on those, then I'll be better protected, thinking I'm protecting myself, not again about source control, not me trying to make sure I don't transmit to someone else. And right now we have a major crisis in this country as with the rest of the world of getting enough uh, respiratory protection for our healthcare workers. As go our healthcare workers, we'll go our healthcare system. These are the frontline people we need to protect at all costs. I cannot emphasize that enough. And if we're right now in a major shortage status, and we will be for the kind of N95 surgical mask protection for healthcare workers, the public should not ever try to get these. But we're already seeing that happen because people are now feeling empowered in part because this cloth mask issue says, yeah, go ahead and use it, it'll possibly help. So I think that, you know, I surely, if someone wants to use a cloth mask, go for it. But as the uh, National Academy of Science report details, the evidence is not there to support the fact that they will have any measurable impact on this pandemic and that we have to be very careful about making assumptions about uh, what, in fact, that they can do. Any last thoughts, Mike? Uh, Thanks, Chris. You know, I keep coming back to, as I do these, is trying to remain optimistic that we're going to get through this because we are. We will get through this, uh, but that we need to have straight talk. And each week I get more concerned and confused about what I'm hearing from leadership about how we're going to get through this. Um, uh, this has become far too much of a political debate, not a a war against a virus and the rest of us as humans all joined together. Um, that's not meant to be a, a political comment of itself. It's just a reality. I've been in far too many 
um, fistfights with viruses like this uh, to know that um, it's going to take everything we have as a as a world, as a country, as a community to come together to deal with this. So I urge that we one try to get a national plan that addresses many of the concerns I expressed today. Number two, that we're all able to get together behind that plan, and uh, that this is not viewed as some partisan issue. Number three, that we actually begin to prepare for the long haul. Uh, if you're only thinking you're going to do a sprint and then only find out as you finish the sprint that you still have many more miles to go, that's when people become disillusioned and no longer trust leadership. We've got to begin to lay out for people, this is a long haul. Second of all, we've got to lay out what we're going to do about it to get through it. And, uh, you know, we're working on that right now here. We surely have a framework for that. Others have tried laying out a framework. All I ask is that it be realistic. You know, don't suddenly say for our plan, we're going to go get lots of N95 respirators. We're going to have lots of mechanical ventilators. We're going to make testing widespread, all which physically can't happen right now. Uh, there's got to be a sense of reality here, and we will continue to try to bring that. And most of all, I think the final thing, as I said in the last podcast, you know, just go out and be nice to somebody today in the way you can. Uh, in keeping our distance, that's hard to do, but reach out through whatever means you have, whether it be a telephone call, uh, writing someone a letter, uh, sending an email, uh, doing the kind of chatting that can be done today in the social world, and reach out to people. Uh, uh, people are lonely. I can tell you just working here at SIDRAP, uh, not having our team around day after day, I had no idea how much I would really truly miss them after weeks of not being with them. That's happening worldwide. Help people out if you can financially. There are people right now that are in dire straits financially. Some of us are in better positions to help people do that. That's the kind of thing that right now will help all of us get through it. And, um, you know, we'll continue to try to bring the most honest, straightforward news we can. Uh, we'll lay out, a, I think, a realistic view of where we're at. And again, I just remind everyone that it's us against the virus. And by God, we're going to win this one, knowing that we'll take some casualties along the way. So thank you. And I look forward to talking to you next week. Thank you, Dr. Osterholm. And thanks for listening to the Osterholm Update, COVID-19 a weekly podcast from the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy. We'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, you can keep up with the latest COVID-19 news by visiting our website, sidrap.umn.edu.